Sheikh Riyadul Haq speech is going to be, inshallah, like no other. And uh, you can benefit from it only if you listen with the intention of learning and acting upon it. I would like to welcome Sheikh Riyadul Haq. Jazakumullah khair. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وسلم السليم. Respected علماء, honored guests, brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. مولانا قاسم informed me just a few moments ago that he himself presented or gave a presentation on some of the finer details of Islamic finance. Of course, they were very technical. And you've also heard a number of other speakers address various aspects of Islamic finance. Rather than go through some of these details, I'd like to share a few thoughts on what Islamic finance is meant to lead to. What's the goal? What's the actual purpose of Islamic finance? What's its ultimate objective? So moving beyond the technicalities, the details, the halal, the haram, permissible, the impermissible, and the mechanisms. Ultimately, what's the goal? What is the purpose? Once we understand the role of Islamic finance in the life of a Muslim, that will actually help us build and develop that Islamic lifestyle which Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have guided us to. And that's why the theme of today's section of the conference is very apt. It's not just about Islamic finance, but Islamic finance and Islamic lifestyle. So, allow me to say a few things about Islamic finance and its role. One of our greatest misunderstandings of Islamic finance is that it's simply a mechanism to make something halal which is haram. And that's it. So, as we know, riba, usury, interest, is forbidden in Islam. Of course, there are different opinions about where and when and to what degree and to which extent and in what detail this prohibition stands. There are differences of opinion amongst the fuqaha and jurists of Islam. That's another issue. But commonly it's believed that Islamic finance merely makes haram halal. And this is similar, a good way of understanding it is the biha, meaning Islamic ritual slaughter. So you have two animals. One hasn't been slaughtered 
according to the rites and rituals of Islam. So its consumption is forbidden. And then you have another animal which has been slaughtered according to the, the rites and rituals of Islamic practice. And suddenly that becomes halal, lawful and pure for consumption. The question is, what's the difference? In some instances, it's just a technicality. It's just a technicality. So, what makes one animal lawful is the mentioning of Allah's name, a few prayers, and then the ritual slaughter in a certain manner. And suddenly that makes that animal halal, lawful, and pure for consumption. So there are just a few differences. So, if we apply that understanding to Islamic finance, the common understanding is that you have two financial products, whether it's a finance package, whether it's a mortgage, whether it's insurance, whether it's bonds, whether it's interest-bearing savings accounts, whatever the nature of the financial product, the common understanding of Islamic finance is that you have two financial products. In almost every aspect, they are identical. But with a twist, with some adjustment, with an alternative mechanism, suddenly that same product becomes halal and lawful. And this is why people are surprised when they look at conventional mortgages and then they look at Islamic finance schemes for house purchase. And commoners who are not scholars, who aren't familiar with the Islamic or financial details, even at first glance, they are quite surprised and they comment that there doesn't seem to be much difference between the two. A slight twist, a small adjustment, and a slightly different mechanism through which this product suddenly becomes halal. Unfortunately, if we think that this mechanism is the sole purpose of Islamic finance, this will be the result. All we will see is a slight technical difference, a small adjustment, and a mechanism by which we make things halal which were previously haram. That is not the goal or the objective of Islamic finance. Nor is a mere ritualistic slaughter the whole goal and purpose of halal food. To understand halal food, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the messengers and the prophets, alayhim salam, Allah instructed the prophets alayhim salatu wa salam Ya ayyuhal rusulu kulu min al-tayyibati wa'amalu salih O messengers eat of the pure and good things wa'amalu salih and do good so the purpose of halal food the purpose of pure food even for the prophets and messengers of Allah was that the consumption of halal food, not just with the mechanism, but with all of its components of the correct intention, of the correct devotion, of the correct attention, of the attention to Allah, and the taking of his name in a very profound and meaningful way, that this consumption of halal food would ultimately lead to good and pure deeds. Good and pure food should lead, lead to good and pure deeds. Similarly, and that was even for the messengers, alayhim salam. Similarly, the purpose of Islamic finance is not to suddenly switch from haram to halal, and it's not just a mechanism to make something lawful, which was a few moments ago unlawful. That is not the ultimate goal and objective of Islamic finance. Rather, Islamic finance is actually a whole philosophy. 
it's a it's a whole it's a whole approach it's a whole mentality it's a whole attitude and indeed it's a whole lifestyle so what is the whole lifestyle of islamic finance again islamic finance is meant to show that the earning of halal and pure income should lead to a pure and halal lifestyle and they go hand in hand it's to actually have the correct outlook on life the idea isn't that muslims have the same conventional outlook on life as others the only difference is that instead of a conventional mortgage we have a halal mortgage instead of conventional insurance we have a takaful system and that's it that's not the purpose and a good way of understanding this is in the quran towards the end of surah al-baqarah the last surah al-baqarah is the longest surah of the quran and you can actually divide it into five parts and the final fifth of surah al-baqarah is more or less devoted to wealth it's actually devoted to wealth and i'll say a few more issues uh, i'll say a few more things about the philosophy of wealth so the final fifth of surah al-baqarah is actually devoted to wealth and there are two verses right at the end of surah al-baqarah towards the end of this final fifth of surah al-baqarah which are unique these two verses are absolutely unique and they are both adjacent one consecutive one after the other the second verse is unique because it's the longest verse in the entire quran and the verse begins with ya ayyuhalladhina amanu idha tadayantum bi dinin ila ajalin musamman faktubu o believers when you lend and borrow to and from from each other for a fixed period faktubu then register this record this transaction of credit of a loan of lending and borrowing and then the verse continues with a number of instructions and laws about lending and borrowing and this is the longest verse of the holy quran it's longer than actually it's actually longer than some surahs it is it's longer than some of the surahs of the of, of the 30th part of the quran it's the longest verse and remarkably the longest verse of the holy quran is not about prayer salah it's not about hajj pilgrimage it's not about zakah charity it's not about siyam fasting it's not about any of the ibadat the acts of worship or the other pillars of islam the longest verse of the holy quran is not even about the hereafter the longest verse of the holy quran is actually just about islamic finance but less someone thinks that this is the whole goal and purpose the verse immediately before this is also unique So this verse is unique in that it's the longest verse of the Holy Quran. The verse before it is also unique. And why is it unique? It's unique because it's the final verse of the Holy Quran to be ever revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The final verse. And what's that verse? Wattaqu yawman turja'una fihi ila Allah. ثم توفى كل نفس ما كسبت وهم لا يظلمون that's the final verse in fact some ulama say that this verse was revealed only 9 days before the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam departed from this world this was the final verse so what does the final verse of the holy quran say it says and fear a day in which you shall all be returned to Allah then every soul shall be requited and repaid in full for whatever it has earned wa hum la yuzlamun an nam 
shall suffer any injustice. So the final verse of the Holy Quran is a reminder to the believers that yes, you have the laws of Islamic finance. You have the instructions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about earning halal and consuming halal and accumulating halal. You have all the laws of buying, lending, borrowing, trading, selling, markets. However, do not ever forget your true purpose. Do not ever forget your ultimate destination. Do not ever forget your true destiny. All of this is temporary. And it's only meant to aid you, to assist you, and to help you in your brief sojourn, your brief journey on earth. Otherwise, the greater purpose, even of Islamic finance, is a whole philosophy, a whole lifestyle, a whole attitude to prepare you for your ultimate destiny. And that is whether we like it or not. And indeed, this is one of the things that separates Islam from many of the traditions, many of the faiths. A strong belief in the finite nature, the brief nature of life on earth and standing before Allah, resurrection, accountability in the hereafter. Ultimately, this is what it's about. So, these are, Islamic finance isn't just about mechanisms. And if someone just practices Islamic finance without this philosophy, without this attitude, without this overall outlook, then they won't be honoring the true teachings of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So imagine, this is the final verse of the Holy Qur'an. It's unique. It's just before the longest verse of the Qur'an, which is all about Islamic finance. But the purpose is, prepare for the final day. Prepare for accountability. Live such a pure life and have such a pure lifestyle that you will be able to stand before Allah in a good way on the day of reckoning. Another good example is Surah Al-Mutaffifin. This is about Islamic finance too. Allah says, وَيْلٌ لِلْمُطَفِّفِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا اكْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَٰئِكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْرُوثُونَ لِيَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ يَوْمِ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah says, woe be, and again, this show, this is another aspect of Islamic finance. In Arabia, in both Mecca and Medina, one of the reasons the Prophet ﷺ introduced some of these laws especially to do with riba, interest usually, is that in Arabia, it was a pretty lawless society. The rich, the powerful, the influential, the wealthy, the elite, they did oppress the lower classes. And especially when it came to prohibitive lending and borrowing. So people would become ultimate slaves, economic slaves to their masters because they were unable to repay the loans which had compound interest on them. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through the verses of the Holy Quran and through his own teachings he forbade, he prohibited, he prohibited riba in all its forms. Another practice in Mecca, Medina, and throughout Arabia was cheating and fraud in trading. And this is what Allah condemns in these beginning verses of Surah Al-Mutaffifin, which we are all familiar with, the Surah. So Allah says, Woe be unto the stinters, the reducers. And He Himself defines who they are. الَّذِينَ إِذَا اكْتَالُوا عَلَى النَّاسِ يَسْتَوْفُونَ وَإِذَا كَالُوهُمْ أَوْ وَزَنُوهُمْ يُخْسِرُونَ The stintists, the mutaffifin, are those who, when they measure for the sake of themselves, they exact the full measure. They take the full payment. They make sure that the measurement is complete. And even 
overfilled. But when they measure or weigh for the sake of other people in that they have to pay, they reduce the amount. They skim. They stint. They skimp. They cheat. They defraud. This isn't an innocent practice. Allah curses these cheats and frauds. Even though the fraud isn't great. That's the very meaning of tatfif. Tatfif actually means that you accumulate wealth through a very gradual process by a few grains. So when you're measuring rice, what you do is that you reduce the rice by a few grains. And in that way, you increase your profits by reducing the amount you give to the buyer. Or, when you are measuring for yourself, you increase a few grains of corn, of rice, a few grams of flour, so that you benefit. And why do you do this, that you only increase it by a small amount? The thinking behind it is, the philosophy behind it is, that by tatfif, by reducing the amount or increasing it by tatfif, an imperceptible, minuscule, small, minute amount, you will gradually build up your wealth over time. It's a very lowly, despicable behavior. And it's not innocent. Allah curses it. Because this behavior was rampant in the marketplaces of Mecca and Medina. In fact, some of the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum say that before we arrived in Medina, Medina was, it was called Yathrib, it was the, one of the worst and most corrupt places in terms of market trading. People would cheat and defraud each other. Until Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came. He introduced these teachings. And then now, the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum said, it is one of the best places, one of the purest places, most honest places for buying, selling, and trading. So Allah actually curses these traders. But then, and this is the point that I wish to make, it's not about the finance, the financial aspect. It's not about just being honest in one's trade. It's about the philosophy behind it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says immediately thereafter, أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَٰئِكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْرُوثُونَ لِيَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ يَوْمَ يَقُومُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَادَمِينَ Allah says, do these people not think that they will be resurrected on a great day, on the day when mankind shall stand before the Lord of the worlds? Truly, you can take verse after verse of the Holy Qur'an. On the one hand, Allah will speak about halal and haram and finance or laws of what's permissible and what's not permissible. But immediately thereafter, or before, or in the same context, there will be a reminder that the purpose of these laws, the purpose of these teachings, is your ultimate destiny, your goal, your journey, your accountability before Allah, your resurrection, and your realization that this life is brief, finite, and that you must stand before Allah to account for your deeds. And this is why Allah says immediately here, after speaking about cheating and fraud, in the marketplace, immediately Allah says, do these people not think that they will be resurrected? Because it's this lack of conviction, lack of fear of accountability, lack of belief in the akhirah, true belief. Verbally, nominally, we all say we believe in the hereafter. Uthman radiallahu an, the son-in-law of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he would say a number of things, all together, he would say things such as, I marvel and I am surprised that someone who says he believes in the hereafter but does not prepare for it. I marvel at someone who says that he believes in the grave but makes no preparation for it. I marvel at someone who says that he believes in standing before Allah and being held accountable for his or her deeds yet it makes no preparation for that reckoning. And then he goes on to say a number of things, 
all in the same vein that I am surprised at, I marvel at someone who on the one hand verbally claims that he believes in the grave, he believes in life after death, he believes in the akhirah, he believes in the afterlife, he believes in accountability before Allah, he believes in the day of resurrection, he believes in the day of yawmuddin, of requital, of reckoning, yet he makes no move, no effort to prepare himself for that reckoning, for that accountability. And indeed, something to reflect on, because this is what the Qur'an also constantly reminds us of. The whole Qur'an, the Qur'an contains so much. It contains stories of the prophets of the past, alayhim salam. It contains some of the history of the previous nations. It contains parables, similitudes, examples. The Qur'an contains ultimately many, many laws. Laws about marriage, divorce, inheritance, trading, buying, selling, borrowing, finance, social matters. Yet, ultimately, what is the goal of all of these laws? What is the goal of all of these teachings? The goal of the laws of Islamic finance is not that you make a comfortable life on earth. The goal isn't that you live just as others live, with the same dreams. Many years ago, I saw this leaflet for an Islamic finance product. I saw a leaflet for an Islamic finance product. And the leaflet had a diagram with photos and pictures. And it was a circle of life. And what it showed was birth, in a picture of a baby then, so birth, childhood, education, job, marriage, children, divorce, yes, even included divorce. So marriage, children, divorce, a home, well, a home before the divorce, and retirement, and all of the pictures were of the same philosophy that permeates modern thinking. A beautiful suburban home, an idyllic location for retirement, substantial wealth. It was no different to the dreams and the aspirations of any other individual. The only thing was all of this will be, will be financed not by conventional means, but by Islamic means. Again, it's just a mechanism to lead the same lifestyle with the same outlook, the same understanding and the same philosophy, the same dreams and aspirations as everyone else. Truly, this is not the goal, not the purpose, not the objective of Islamic finance. The purpose of Islamic finance is to lead one to a truly Islamic lifestyle. A truly Islamic lifestyle. And that is one that focuses on the hereafter, on the akhirah. This is what Rasulullah practiced himself. This is what he taught his followers. This is what he wanted for himself, for his chosen ones, for his loved ones, for his family, for his children. Truly. Once the Prophet وسلم, came home, he came to his daughter's home, Fatima radiallahu anha's home. They had a rug, a curtain which acted as the door, a rug, and he had pictures on it. The Prophet وسلم, felt uncomfortable with this display, with this ostentatious display. He turned away. She was in, the family were in, but he turned away. Fatima radiallahu anha learned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam came and he turned away. She inquired as to why from Ali radiallahu anha. Ali radiallahu anha inquired. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, I came and I saw this display of colors and of images on this curtain. And I disapproved of it. So I turned back. 
Ali radiyallahu an and Fatima radiyallahu anha immediately removed it and distributed in charity. This is what he wanted for his children, for his loved ones. This lifestyle, a lifestyle which focused on the hereafter. He would call himself a traveler and he would tell the companions, be travelers. And truly, it's an amazing message. It provides wisdom. It grounds a person. It enables a person, it equips a person with the skills and the abilities to cope with the trials and hardships of life. When a person understands their place in the world, vis-a-vis their place in the afterlife. Truly. And just imagine, once the Prophet ﷺ was lying down on the ground, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum came to visit him. And he had his upper torso bare. So he never had an upper cloak. And he was resting on a mat. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was visited by these companions, what he did was that he sat up. And since he was lying down, the mat had left its imprint of crisscrosses on his side and on his back. Because it was a bear torso. So when the companion saw these marks and the imprints of the straw mat on the back and on the arm of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were affected. So they exclaimed, O Messenger of Allah, if only you would have told us, we would have laid out some bedding for you. Now listen to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's reply. And I say, Reflect on what they were saying and then think about what his reply is. They are talking about something else and his reply is something else. They are talking about the earth and his reply is of the heavens. So they said, if only you would have told us, we would have laid out some bedding for you so that you wouldn't have these marks and imprints of the mat on your noble body. And his reply was, They are saying, if only you would have told us, we would have laid out some bedding. And his reply is, what connection do I have with the world? My example in the world is that of a traveler who rested beneath a tree and took shade. Then once he had rested, he rose and continued with his journey. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told them, These comforts, I care not for them. My whole life on earth is like a brief stop to catch some shade beneath a tree. Once I have rested and caught some shade, I rise and I leave. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called himself a traveler. Imam Bukhari, Imam Tirmidhi and others all relate a hadith from Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma, the son of Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu anh. He says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam grabbed me by my shoulders. He did that in order to emphasize the upcoming point. He grabbed Abdullah ibn Umar radiyallahu anhuma by his shoulders. And looking at him squarely in his face, in his eyes, he said to him, Oh Abdullah! كُنْ فِي الدُّنْيَا كَأَنَّكَ غَرِيبٌ أَوْ عَابِرُ السَّبِيلٌ O Abdullah, be in the world as though you are a stranger. Nay, a wayfarer, a traveler. And then he continued in the narration of Tirmidhi, he continued. When you rise in the morning, do not wait for the evening. When you rise in the evening, do not wait for the morning. Now, I know this sounds slightly morbid and dispiriting and unenthusiastic that we are suddenly talking about the brevity of life, the reality of life, and our focus on the akhirah. But whether we like it or not, this is the teaching of the Qur'an. We can't escape from it. This was the teaching of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, this was the lifestyle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He called himself a traveler. 
He told his companions to call themselves and consider themselves to be travelers. And this leads me to the final thing, which is, again, I'm still speaking about Islamic lifestyle in the context of Islamic finance. I said earlier on that I'll mention a few things about the philosophy of wealth. So I'll end in a few minutes. What exactly is the philosophy of wealth in Islam? As I said, Islamic finance should be about a whole attitude, a whole approach, a whole philosophy. What is the philosophy of wealth in Islam? The philosophy of wealth in Islam can best be summarized by a few verses from the final verses of two surahs of the Holy Quran. Surah Al-Jum'ah and Surah Al-Munafiqun. Jum'ah is obviously the most important congregation in the week. And it's the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was his practice that in his lifetime he would recite Surah Al-Jum'ah in the first rak'ah of Jum'ah and Surah Al-Munafiqun in the second rak'ah of Jum'ah. Week in, week out. So he had four famous surahs that he would recite in Jum'ah. Surah Al-A'la and Surah Al-Ghashiyah. Some weeks he would recite Surah Al-A'la in the first rak'ah, Surah Al-Ghashiyah in the second rak'ah. On other occasions he would recite Surah Al-Jum'ah in the first rak'ah and Surah Al-Munafiqun in the second rak'ah of Jum'ah. So let's look at these two surahs, Surah Al-Jum'ah and Surah Al-Munafiqun. In Surah Al-Jum'ah, towards the end, Allah mentions the first pillar of the philosophy of wealth in Islam. First pillar. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِذَا نُودِيَ لِلصَّلَاةِ مِنْ يَوْمِ الْجُمْعَةِ فَاسْعَوْا إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَذَرُوا الْبَيْعِ And then later, فَإِذَا قُضِيَتِ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ I know there's, I've missed out in, a bit in between deliberately because these are the two main points that I wish to focus on now. What do these verses say? This is the first pillar of the philosophy of wealth in Islam. The first foundation. Which is, contrary to popular belief, Islam encourages the generation and the creation of wealth. It does. Islam, this is the first thing of Islamic finance. Islam teaches us, the Quran tells us, and the believers would hear this message every other week at times in the Jumu'ah Salah. So what is it? The first pillar of the philosophy of wealth in Islam is work hard, earn, create wealth, generate wealth for yourselves, for your families, for society, for the community at large. Islam believes in hard work. Stand on your own feet. Do not be dependent. Do not ask from others. Do not ask from others if you can avoid it. Work hard, so much so that unlike other religious traditions where there is a day of rest, so on Saturday, on the Sabbath, work is forbidden. On Sunday, the equivalent of the Sabbath, work is forbidden. Ours is Jumu'ah, and one would have assumed that work is forbidden on Jumu'ah, or at least even discouraged. No. The reason is, the belief of rest on the Sabbath and the belief of rest on Sunday is because, this is why even uh, now, we have restricted trading hours by law on the Sunday because this is a remnant of the day of rest. And the Sabbath and the Sunday day of rest is based on the philosophy and understanding that God created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. Islam has no such belief. And he was not fatigued or tired by their creation. So what does the Quran tell us about Jumu'ah? Allah tells us, O oh believers, when the call is given for the prayer on Friday, then hasten towards the remembrance of Allah. And abandon trading, leave trading. And then later, فَإِذَا قُضِيَتِ الصَّلَاةِ Then when the prayer is complete, disperse in the land and seek of the bounty of Allah, meaning go out and earn again. So the Quran actually tells us, trade all the way up to Jumu'ah. Take a break. 
hasten towards the remembrance of Allah, listen to the khutbah and the sermon, bow, prostrate before Allah, complete your prayer as soon as you finish praying. If you want to rest, you can. But if you don't, fine. Go out in the land of Allah, earn, work and trade again. So even on the day of supposed rest, Muslims have been told you can work, you should work, if you want. That's the first philosophy. Work hard, generate wealth. In fact, be a trader if you can. All of the muhajirun and the Prophet ﷺ himself, the Muqqans were traders. All the four khulafa, the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, عنهم, the al-ashratul mubashara, the ten promised jannah, and almost all of the muhajirun, the emigrants from Mecca to Medina, they were all traders. The Ansar were predominantly the, they, they were predominantly agriculturalists and farmers. But the Prophet ﷺ and the Muqqans who emigrated were all invariably traders. Trade, trade, do business, create wealth, generate wealth for yourself, for your families, for your children, for society at large, for the community. Islam believes in trading. Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Shaybani, rahimahullah, one of the three great imams of the Hanafi school of fiqh, he was the first author to come out with a beautiful book dedicated to earning, Kitab al-Kasb. Kitab al-Kasb, the book of tr- earning. Earn. The whole book is about earning, earning, earning. So that's the first pillar of the philosophy of wealth in Islam. Earn. But then you have to earn with a vision. You have to earn with a philosophy. You have to earn with understanding, with an outlook. So what is that outlook? Allah then tells us at the end of Surah Al-Munafiqoon, and the Muslims would hear this regularly, and we hear it in the Jumu'ah Salah. وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ أَحْدَكُمُ الْمَوْتِ And spend of what we have bestowed upon you, of sustenance and provisions, before death comes upon you. Truly, this is a second pillar of, philosoph- of the philosophy of wealth in Islam, which is, once Allah has given you wealth, what should you do with it? Do not hoard wealth. Do not accumulate it. Do not cling on to it. Rather, share it. Distribute it. Spend it. Spend it wisely. Spend it on others. Give to others. Share with others. This is a second pillar of the philosophy of wealth in Islam. Truly share. Create wealth and then share it. Generate wealth and spread it. There is no point in hoarding it and accumulating it. Because it never belongs to you. One of the unique teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we have to actually, we have to tune our thinking. We have to tune our thinking. We have to calibrate our thinking. We have to tune ourselves into the correct frequency. Otherwise we will never understand it. In Islam, indeed, less is more, more is less. Giving is taking, taking is giving. Hoarding is losing. And giving is earning. There are many ways of thinking about this. Allah says in the Quran, speaking about riba, this Islamic finance, what's the key concept of Islamic finance? Avoid riba. What does riba actually mean in Arabic? Of course, we understand it to mean usury, interest. But originally, what does riba mean? For those ulama amongst you and the talabatul ilm and students of Arabic and the native Arabic speakers, riba yarbu riban. It means nama yanmu numu and zaka yasku zaka'an. It means to grow, to flourish, to increase. So riba means an increase. That's all it means. And Allah explains it beautifully in a verse. مَا آتَيْتُم مِّن رِبَ اللَّهِ يَرْبُوا فِي أَمْوَالِ النَّاسِ فَلَا يَرْبُوا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَمَا آتَيْتُم مِّن زَكَاةٍ تُرِيدُونَ وَجْحَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُضْعِفُونَ Allah says, that wealth which you deposit or which you give of riba so that it may actually increase with the people. فَلَا يَرْبُوا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ It does not increase by Allah. So to us, it increases. You have a hundred, 
You place it in the bank, suddenly you have 105. Of course there's an increase of five. Allah says, no, there is no increase. Even though you see it. فَلَا يَرْبُوا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ It does not increase by Allah. وَمَا آتَيْتُمْ مِنْ زَكَاةٍ تُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُدْعِفُونَ And what you give of zakah, of charity, seeking the countenance of Allah, these are the ones who are actually the ones who increase. We have a hundred, you give ten in charity, you're left with ninety. Of course there's a decrease. Allah says no. Even though to you it seems it's a reduction by Allah, with Allah, this is truly an increase. We have to flip our thinking. More is less in Islam, less is more. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught this. He came home, there was an animal that was slaughtered, meat was distributed. So the Prophet sallallahu said to Aisha radiallahu anha, what happened with that meat? So Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha said, Ya Rasulullah, we've distributed almost all of it. That's gone. This much remains. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, No. That remains. This is still left to go. That remains. This is still left to go. Giving is taking. Taking is giving. Less is more. More is less. And in another hadith, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa explains this beautifully. Again, it's about wealth. So I was saying gener- the second pillar is generate wealth to spread it. Increase wealth to distribute it. There is no point in hoarding it because it's not yours. Prophet sallallahu relates in a hadith. There are two hadith in Sahih Muslim. One is related by Abdullah ibn Shakhir radiallahu an, The other by Sayyidina Abu Hurairah radiallahu an. Both hadith come together and the meaning is similar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says... Man keeps on saying, Mali, Mali. Man keeps on repeating, My wealth, my wealth. We do, we do it all the time. My car, my money, my bank balance, my account. This is my money. Husband and wife keep on telling each other, This is yours, this is mine. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Man keeps on saying, My wealth, my wealth. Whereas in reality, he has no wealth, except that which he has spent. Except that which he has eaten and expired, which he has worn and worn out, which he has given in the way of Allah and therefore hoarded for himself. We have to actually think about it. So what the Prophet ﷺ is telling us, even if you've got a million in the bank, it's not yours. All you are doing is losing sleep whilst guarding over it. If you've got a million in the bank, aren't you worried about it? Of course. You worried that the taxman will come for it. You worried that the minister of the interior will come for it meaning the home minister, one's partner, one's spouse. You worried that the relatives will come for it. You worried that something will happen and it will disappear. So you've got a million in the bank. You are losing sleep over it. You are suffering anxiety because of it. You are worried about it. And you are guarding it. But you're guarding it for others. It's not yours. What is yours is if you've eaten something, you've eaten it. You've eaten a slice of bread, it's gone. It's energized you. It's nourished you. No one else can have it. That's yours. It's gone. That's yours. You've worn a piece of cloth which you've run down and worn out so much that it's not even good for the charity shop or the clothes bank. No one can make use of it. That's yours. That's yours. If you've got something which is good enough for the charity shop, you are only borrowing it for a while. It's gone to someone else. If you've worn it out, and these are the words of the hadith, إِلَّا مَا أَكَلَ فَأَفْنَى أَوْ لَبِسَ فَأَبْلَى Or he worn and worn out. Or number three, you've gave in the way of Allah, then that is recorded for you in the akhirah by Allah. That's in your name. That belongs to you. 
You've got a million in the bank, you give a hundred in the name of Allah, that's now yours. The million is still not yours. And that's why at the end of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, only these three things belong to man. As for all besides these three categories, then he is about to leave i.e. the world and leave those things behind for the people. We have to truly shift and change our thinking of wealth in Islam. So the first pillar of wealth, the philosophy of wealth is earn, work hard, generate wealth, create wealth. Second, once you have done so, spread it. Spread it sincerely. Share it. And the third pillar of the philosophy of wealth in Islam is going back to what I began with. Allah again mentions this towards the end of Surah Al-Munafiqun. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la tulhikum amwalukum wa la awladukum an dhikri Allah, wa man yaf'al dhalika fa'ulaika humul khasir. O oh, believers, do not let your riches and your children distract you from the remembrance of Allah. And whoever is guilty of this, why do we earn? Why do we work so hard? Why do we educate ourselves in a certain manner? Why do we try to vie and compete with each other in climbing the career ladder? Why do we build our homes with a view to one-upmanship and competition and rivalry with our neighbors and with others. Why do we do all this? Because none of us want to be losers. We all want to be winners. But Allah says in this verse, O oh believers, do not let your riches and your children distract you from the remembrance of Allah. And whoever does this, al khasirun. These are the losers. They are the losers. Anybody, anybody like being called a loser? Allah is calling us losers. If one other human being says to your face, you're a loser, it says so much. It will prick your ego. It will destroy you and crush you. It will lead you pensive and thoughtful for some time. And Allah is telling us that if you do this, you are losers. And Allah is telling us that. So the third, the third pillar of, of the philosophy of wealth in Islam is once you've earned wealth, created wealth, generated wealth, Two, you've distributed wealth, shared wealth. What you have with you, do not ever, ever let become distracted by wealth. To such a degree that your gaze is averted from the Akhirah. And that's what I began with. Islamic finance is not just a mechanism. It's meant to create a pure, wholesome lifestyle with a certain attitude, with a certain outlook, with a certain philosophy. Without this attitude, without this outlook, without this philosophy, even Islamic finance is meaningless in itself. It's just a mechanism. And that third pillar is, do not be distracted. I'll end by saying, Islam teaches us, it actually encourages us, to create wealth and to generate wealth. It does. But he also tells us, Wealth is something to possess, not be possessed by it. Possess wealth. Do not become possessed by wealth. Have it in your hands, but not in your heart. Possess wealth, but do not be possessed by wealth. And a true Islamic lifestyle with Islamic finance is one that follows the wholesome teachings of Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and one only needs to look at the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's own life and that of the companions to gain a good understanding of how a Muslim should live and with what view, with what vision and with what philosophy. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to understand. May Allah azza wa jal make us amongst those who are truly blessed in hand with wealth but whose hearts are not possessed by that wealth. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasoolih, nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdika shalwa Allah ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh.